And for those who are watching on our uh, video recording, as you can tell, we have a power outage today, but we're still worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. In spite of that, worshiping by candlelight, the power may come on during the service. That'll be a blessing. And if it doesn't, we're still in God's word today. And I do want to encourage those um, who are listening on video. We're getting ready to read from John 17, verses 1 through 11. But I would also encourage you, uh, before listening to today's sermon, to turn to Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. And read that as well before listening to today's sermon. And now for our gospel reading from John which is chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory, Glory be to thee, thee, O Lord. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me for the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them. And they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be, be to thee, Lord, Lord Christ, Christ, in the name Lord of the Father, Father and of the Son, and, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How many times each week or each day do you quietly wish for those better days that we so fondly remember from our youth? It's a daily thing for me, and I know that I'm not alone on that. I want those better days when the economy was stronger and it seemed that my hard-earned dollars took me more places. Two decades ago, when I got a Friday paycheck, the first thing I did was call a group of friends and put together a last minute road trip with a mighty fine meal stop as the final destination. These days my paychecks are larger, but considering the price of restaurant meals and the gasoline to get there, I'm far more likely to do the boring adult thing and fix a simple meal at home. I would like to see better days again, but for now I have to live into the present reality. The present reality is hard work. We put in many days of overtime due to the lack of adequate staffing. We often have to interact with people who have had a particularly bad, exhausting day. We would love and would thoroughly enjoy at every paycheck the luxuries of a fancy meal in a beautiful setting 
may be followed up with a nice, fresh, premium coffee, a rich dessert, and some soothing instrumental music in the background like we remember from the late 1990s. Whoa, I'm getting nostalgic here. In short, we want those better days. We selfishly want those better days. But how we feel in this present moment hardly compares to how the apostles felt as recalled in the first chapter of the book of Acts where our first lesson today came from. This group of men had been through long episodes of hard work, dangerous travel, and frightening occurrences. From the time Jesus called some of them to be fishers of men, through his teachings that drew crowds and especially through his passion, death, and resurrection, these guys were drained, stressed, frightened, and worried. These first verses in the Acts of the Apostles cover the short amount of time that the apostles spent with Jesus in the aftermath of everything and yet moments before he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of sight as the scriptures say and what we know is the ascension and in that time that they spent with Jesus before he ascended into heaven the apostles were wondering will we see those better days with all they had been through, surely it would lead to something better. And if Jesus was able to conquer death, then surely his next move or miracle would be to restore those better days of a, a glorious kingdom, a prosperous kingdom of David. For generations, the Jews were longing for the day when God's own Messiah would come down to earth and bring Israel to something better. Those better days were a time when there was a succession of prestigious kings, such as who they had with Solomon and David. Those better days were a time when Israel's economy was vibrant and prosperous and secured by brute military strength. Surely Jesus would bring back those better days now that he had conquered death and proven to them his divinity. But how did Jesus respond to their question? Jesus did not answer them with a yes or with a no. Instead, he assured them that the Father had set his own authority and that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. This he said before he ascended into heaven right before their very eyes. He may have left them a little confused and perhaps these words leave us a little confused too. What did Jesus mean? that the Father had set his own authority when their question pertained to the issue of Israel. And what does the coming of the Holy Spirit have to do with anything? The answer is in the details. By conquering death and being resurrected, Jesus acquired all authority on heaven and on earth for all time. That's why the scriptures tell us that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. We read in John's Gospel today where Jesus claims this authority not for his own name's sake, but so that God's people may have eternal life. In other words, the question the apostles asked of Jesus did not warrant a yes or no answer. The question itself was irrelevant. There is no need to restore a glorious earthly kingdom when all dominion on heaven and on earth belongs to the risen Lord. 
There's no need to long for better days when everything in this life, the good, the bad, the joyful, and the boring, and all the in-between is all fulfilled in God's mighty work. But what about the Holy Spirit? Why does he get mentioned in response to this question? We'll go back to the prayer that Jesus offers in the presence of the disciples and that we read this morning in John's Gospel. Jesus prayed to the Father to give his disciples protection once he was out of this world. Jesus prayed for their protection because he was preparing them for something they were not ready to accept just yet. Because he was getting ready to leave this world, they would need his presence in another substance. That substance is the Holy Spirit. They needed the presence of the Holy Spirit and God's own protection for yet another reason that they were not ready to accept. That Jesus would be sending them out into the world to do his work that would glorify God. They were tired and exhausted from doing enough work already. And now they had to do more work going forward. Instead of restoring an earthly kingdom, Jesus called on the apostles to abandon the thought of political security and economic prosperity and instead go into the fields and into the lands proclaiming the good news of God's saving grace. The good news that they would proclaim was not the good news of better days in an earthly kingdom with a popular and prestigious king sustained by a strong economy and protected by a powerful army. The good news instead involves the better days of the eternal kingdom of God sustained by grace and protected by the presence of the Holy Spirit and under the reign of <coughs> Jesus Christ who holds all authority on heaven and on earth for all time. The disciples represented the desire of Israel to have something restored on earth. But Jesus represents the desire of God to restore people to his eternal glory and from their brokenness to sin. The disciples wanted an eternal kingdom so they could live in comfort and security isolated from the outside world and without worry. Jesus instead called them to abandon those thoughts altogether and go into the world preaching the good news of eternal security and the fellowship of the Holy Comforter, the Holy Spirit. In saying these things and learning these things, we find that Jesus was ministering to us, his disciples who live in the here and now. When we stop to think about it, we have similar earthly desires comparable to the early disciples. Like the disciples, we want those better days. We want protection, prosperity, and leaders with a good name and reputation. Inevitably, we get nostalgic about those better days when we had that, or at least we thought we had that. We want things to happen the easy way where all we have to do is put in our hours and then use some of our paycheck to go out and enjoy the better things in life. However, Jesus calls us to something eternal. Jesus calls us to get beyond our nostalgia and live into our calling as witnesses of God's mighty work and the saving help 
that he brings through Jesus Christ, his only son, and empowered through the constant presence of the Holy Spirit. Next Sunday is a special day in the life of the church. The day of Pentecost at 50 days beyond Easter Sunday is when the church commemorates the coming of the Holy Spirit and her empowerment to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. We need to prepare ourselves for that special day and it goes beyond wearing something red to represent the tongues as a fire mentioned in the book of Acts. We need to prepare ourselves for the work God calls us to do, that Jesus leads us to, and that the Holy Spirit empowers us to do. Our calling and our work <coughs> is to live out and tell out the good news of God's salvation. It's a work that's beyond the walls of the church. Yes, we are tired from hard work and the everyday concerns of life. We want those better days. <coughs> But when it comes to our faith and the commitment we made in our baptism, none of that matters. The work we do for the proclamation of the gospel is not to bring back those better days that we fondly remember. The work is to make sure that all of our days, the good and the bad, the joyful and the boring, and everything in between reach their conclusive fulfillment in the Lord's eternal kingdom. Those days are the better days. From this moment, make a new commitment. Come back to church next week ready to live out and proclaim out loud the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, freshly renewed and empowered by the Holy Spirit who is with us always and forever. The best days we could ever imagine or hope for are ahead of us in all of eternity. Praise God and amen. Amen.